Hey you and welcome. My name is Mike and in this old video we're going to the town of Boulder, Colorado. A town, you know, so exciting they named it after a rock. Clarifying that was a joke, do not hate me. Please. In this one we're talking Scotty. Scott Lee Kimball. Hannibal to his friends, if he had any. And we'll also talk about Operation Snowball because this story... You'll see. See, Scotty was quite the naughty boy. It's quite the story, so let's start telling it. Scott Lee Kimball was born in September 1966 in Boulder, Colorado. Not much is really known about his early life, so we're gonna skip through this part because I don't really have much to say. But one thing he did love was money that wasn't his, if you know what I mean. He had a bit of a history, and in fact this case will take us all across the Centennial State and beyond. But right now we're gonna skip forward a few decades to when Scott Kimball met a woman named Lori McLeod. They met in February 2003 at a small casino in Colorado. Lori was divorced, her daughter Casey lived with her, and when Lori met Scott playing cards, sparks flew, as they do. He told Lori he was an FBI agent, holy smokes lads. He, you know, he would be the kind of person you would really want around if and when something went wrong. And, as they always do, something did. Scott himself was divorced with two kids of his own, an outdoorsman. Scott treated Lori like a queen, and her daughter too, Casey, who grew very fond of him. Scott eventually moved in with Lori and Casey just outside of Denver. Casey was 19 years old and had her own share of troubles by that age, getting involved with drugs. However, by the time Scott arrived, she was clean and working to get back on the straight and narrow. However, in the summer of 2003, Scott found a pipe in Casey's room. He brought it to Lori, who knew exactly what it was who went after Casey. And while, you know, Casey would vehemently deny it was hers, she said it wasn't hers, she wasn't back on drugs or anything, Lori would eventually threaten to call the cops at which point Casey just left and never returned. Lori asked Scott to go find her. You know, he's an FBI agent, right? He would know best. And a few years later, after Casey left, he did. He set up Casey and her boyfriend, you know, with a motel room. And they were like, you know, it'll be fine. Just let him cool off, you know? Cooler heads prevail. But a few days later, Casey called Lori. She said, you know, over the phone, I'm sorry, mom. You know, uh, I love you. And after that, she was never heard from again. A few days later, Casey's boyfriend came to Lori and said, Casey never came home. Her work, Casey's work, said she never showed. Casey's boyfriend told Lori the last time he had seen Casey was when Scott came to pick up Casey and bring her to work, work where she never showed. Though Scott would say he didn't pick her up. He didn't know what he was yapping about. He never picked up Casey. He, in fact, was out of town for a few days up the mountains when Casey was last seen. However, as now no one knew where Casey was, Scott said, don't worry, I got you. I'll call my, uh, the old FBI buddies. They'll, uh, they'll pick up the case. Lori tried to go to the police to report her daughter missing, but her daughter, she was 19 years old, she was over age, you know, so there wasn't anything suspicious, no suspicious circumstances, so it seemed like she might have just upped and left herself to start fresh. God knows where. Scott Kimball, you know, with his authority, he said, I'm gonna, I'll take care of this now, I'm gonna keep track. I got her social security, her bank details. She pops up, I'll let you know. But that was it. Not much could be done at this stage. It just seemed like she just ran away. Not long after, Lori and Scott got married in Las Vegas, still hoping that Casey would show. After all, Lori needed Scott. He was her only hope of ever finding her daughter. However, days, weeks, and months would go by, Lori just hoping she wasn't down an alley somewhere. Eventually, a year went by. 
In 2004, Laurie and Scott moved outside the city of Denver to some farmland to start up a business called Rocky Mountain All Natural Beef. At one point, after one of Scott's sons, 10-year-old Jason, had a freak accident that put him in hospital, Scott's uncle Terry moved in with him, and he brought himself a suitcase full of kiboshta. He was an elf fella who Laurie didn't really like, as he gave her the creeps. However, old Uncle Terry, after staying with Scott and Lori for less than a month, he vanished. Scott told Lori the improbable story of his Uncle Terry winning the lottery and running away with a stripper to Mexico. Ooh, or, or maybe it was the Caribbean. Or whatever. You know, it was someplace warm and not America. The story, you know, however unbelievable, was a relief to Lori who just wanted him gone. The beef business, though, was starting to look a bit moo. You know, and Lori and Scott started to drift apart. Lori began to even suspect Scott, who would disappear for, you know, extended periods of time, that maybe he was doing the old deed with some other ladies. But through all this, you know, Lori was desperately seeking answers to her missing daughter, Casey. And it was around this time in early 2006 that a nearby bank reported to police that fake checks were being cashed to the extent of about $80,000. And the checks were being made out to Rocky Mountain Natural Beef. CCTV from the bank even showed Scott was the one taking the money. So the police rocked up to the farm. Lori was there. Scott, no sign of him. So, well, you know, come on, it's his wife. She doesn't know. Pfft, a likely story. Her bullshit was overpowering the actual smell of bullshit. She was brought in, but she honestly didn't actually know anything about the money. She didn't see a dime of it. But she did at one point off-handedly mention that her daughter was missing for two years at this point, and Scott was one of the last people to see her, and that her suspicions about her husband had been mounting for quite some time. Actually giving her money to take off. I knew Scott was in contact with her, taking her to and from work. I knew that he... Um, worked for the FBI. Now the police, obviously, started looking into Scott once they were alerted to the bank you know, fraud scheme. And they found out he had a history of doing this sort of thing, had even been in jail for it before. So when Lori told the police, you know, that her husband, who they were looking for, had, you know, he was a former FBI agent, that didn't quite jive with what they knew which obviously Lori didn't know, they contacted the FBI and learned that Scott was never an agent, but he had been an informant. He had been an informant who had been involved in a murder-for-hire plot, and was also involved in another missing woman's disappearance. Her name was Jennifer Lynn Markham. She had gone missing near Denver less than a year before Casey had disappeared. Jennifer is 25, a single mother who worked as a stripper. The last thing that was known about where she went was that her car was found at Denver Airport, but she didn't take any flights. The FBI were already involved in that uh, search for, you know, missing Jennifer Markham, but it seemed to be going nowhere, though they did have an informant named Joe Snitch. The informant even met with Jennifer's family, who were obviously, you know, looking for answers. And this uh, Joe Snitch... He offered to tell them how she died, offered to perform on them exactly how she died, and offered to take them to the mountains to show them where she was buried. Now this obviously creeped the shit out of her Jennifer out of Jennifer Markham's family, who refused because they didn't think that if they went to the mountains with this Joe Snitch, who seemed to know a lot, you know, the precise details of what happened to their daughter. They didn't think they'd come back from those mountains. So when Jennifer Markham's family went to the FBI and were like, uh, he seems to know a little bit too much about how Jennifer died. Maybe you should, I don't know, do something about it. The FBI were like, ah, don't worry. He's, he's shy talking. Don't worry about him. Old, old Joey Snitchrew. He'd never heard a fly. Jennifer's mother would later call this Joe Snitch. Hello? Joe? Hello? Hello? Joe? 
Yeah, it's true. Yeah, it's Mary. Hey, Mary, what's up? I've been trying to get a hold of you. Oh, did you really, really, really know how my daughter died? Listen, actually. I already told you what I knew. I told you what I can and can't say, and I already told you what I was willing to show you. Now listen, we're not going down this road, okay? I know. I'm not doing it. I, okay, okay, just talk to me, damn it. You had your chance. Listen, listen to me now. I couldn't let you perform those things on me. You know, you're really lucky I'm talking to you now, so. The only thing that means a damn thing to me is my daughter. My and I don't know where in the hell she ended well, up. Are you working for Jenny or against her? I'm working for her, but you have to realize some things that I, I think are important that you know are classified, and I will be in huge trouble if I tell you. So I have to show you. Well, I don't I get it. What do? What can you show me, Joe? Well, listen, I gotta let you go. I don't get it. What can you show me, Joe? I'll see you later. Bye bye. Joe. Joe. It didn't take long for Jennifer's family to figure out who Joe Snitch really was. So, an investigation which began with you know, fake checks being cashed led them to Scott Kimball, which led them to the disappearance of Casey McLeod, which led to the disappearance of Jennifer Markham, which led them to Scott Kimball being an FBI informant, Joe Snitch. And they also learned that Scott's son, who was involved in an accident on the farm, well, it may not have been an accident. After Jason had been involved in an accident on the farm, a heavy metal grate fell on him. Scott rushed him to hospital. He drove him to hospital. However, when Jason regained consciousness, he told the staff that Scott had let the heavy metal grate fall on him, and then had pushed him out of the car as he was rushing him to hospital. Investigators also learned that Scott had been inquiring, you know, what's going on, maybe about insurance policies, the day his son was involved in an accident, and if his son had died, 50 big ones for old Scott. And then, of course, we got Scott's Uncle Terry, who apparently won the lottery and was never seen again. Right. It's March 2006. They have a whole litany of things they're linking Scott to, just beginning with, you know, fake checks, then to disappearances, attempted murder of his own son, and more than likely actual murders. That's what they have, but what they don't have is Scott. Scott was in Alaska. They knew that because he kept in contact with Lori, calling her, sending her photos. Or at least that's what Lori thought, because when the police traced those phone calls Scott was making, turned out they were coming from inside the house. Inside a house in California. After a dramatic car chase that I don't have footage of, he was caught by police there. They were eventually able to charge Scott, you know, with all of those check frauds, but not much else at the time. So what did the FBI think of this? Well, not much. Scott Kimball's life of crime started as soon as he turned 18 having 10 felony convictions by the time our story began, but none of them for violent offences, which is why the FBI never thought he'd be capable of doing what he was doing. He served time in Colorado, Montana, Washington, and Alaska for theft, fraud, forgery, and more. He was actually charged with kidnapping his ex-wife in Washington in 2001, but those charges were dropped as Scott was a snitch. Scott assisted the FBI in a number of investigations. He was a key witness in a case involving the planning of a judge's murder in Alaska and in the murder of an assistant U.S. attorney in Seattle. He was also a witness in a federal arson case in Montana. So he was well used to playing with the cops to get out of jail. See, Scott became an FBI informant after... You guessed it, uh, check fraud again and stealing 50 grand. He was sentenced to prison for that, and he agreed to become an FBI informant 
after befriending a fellow prisoner who was plotting to kill his girlfriend. The girlfriend was Jennifer Markham. So Scott agreed to snitch on this in return for being a paid FBI informant and getting released from prison early. He got out in 2003, shortly before he would meet Laurie McLeod. And after he got out, he began keeping tabs on Jennifer for the FBI. See, Jennifer Markham was due to testify about a meth distribution ring, hence why her boyfriend wanted her gone. And Jennifer would get gone regardless. And it would later turn out that that murder for hire plot didn't exist. He was lying to the FBI the entire time. But the FBI, you know, still didn't think he would be capable of killing or anything like that, you know? In late 2006, Jennifer Markham and uh, Casey McLeod's their fathers go to the FBI, you know, demanding answers about what their former informant, what he'd been up to. They then began to take the two disappearances rather seriously, and that maybe their Joe Snitch was a worse person than they had thought. Operation Snowball began, aptly named for a case that began with fake checks. They were also quickly able to determine that Uncle Terry never won no lottery, and he too was missing. The FBI got Scott's computer, Laurie had kept all of his stuff, you know, since he went to Alaska, and on it they found pictures of women being tortured, killed. And also on his computer they found a picture of this woman. They had no idea who she was, but probably a victim. The FBI eventually sat down with Scott Kimball to try and piece together the missing people. He gave them nothing. I've never murdered anybody. I've never done anything like that. Terry's not missing. He didn't win the lottery. He didn't go to Mexico. We know that much. So he's, he's somewhere, I guess, hiding out in the United States. Or Canada or somewhere. It's real convenient, Scott, that he's hiding out, that Casey's hiding out, that Jennifer's hiding out. But I can't tell you anything about where... Terry or Casey or Jennifer Arnold, if you're going to ask me if I've hurt any of them or killed any of them, the answer is no. They then started tracking down his known accomplices. One was a guy who was in jail for life, a fellow named Stephen Holly. He told the FBI that when him and Scott were in jail together, they hatched an escape plan to get to Mexico. When Scott got out, he went back to Stephen and told him he'd help his buddy get out of jail and that if Stephen gave Scott his girlfriend's information, a woman named Leanne Emery, he'd contact her and they'd arrange to get Stephen Holly out and all the way to Mexico. Though Scott told Stephen, you know, in this escape plan operation, call me Hannibal, that's my code name. Stephen told his girlfriend, Leanne Emery, to contact Scott, call him Hannibal, don't call him Scott, he doesn't like that, and to trust him, which was a big mistake. Of course, when the FBI went and tried to track her down, well, she was last seen near Denver in early 2003. Her car was found abandoned in Utah. Emails from her account told a story of her traveling with a man named Hannibal and never being heard from again. And that picture they found on Scott's computer, now they had a name to the face. And one more missing person to add to Scott's file. It became obvious at this point that Scott Lee Kimball was a serial killer. In all of Scott's things that Laurie had, they found this receipt. It was dated from around the time Casey vanished and it was from a shop near the Root National Forest. The FBI asked the Park Service if anyone had been found or recovered there. And, lo and behold, a skeleton had been found a few years before. It didn't take long to find out it was Casey McLeod. Going back to Scott, they made a deal. You know, he would plead guilty to the fraud charges and plead guilty, you know, to second degree murder if he just told them where he could find Leanne Emery Jennifer Markham and Uncle Terry. He led them on a few wild goose chases in Utah, but ultimately only found Leanne there. No Jennifer. They found Uncle Terry on a mountain in Colorado. 
His deal, because he didn't bring them to Jennifer, was off the table. And then he got two counts of second degree murder. He was sentenced to 70 years in prison. In late 2005, Scott Kimball once again became the focus of a Boulder County investigation, this time for check fraud. It was during the course of that investigation that the murders that Scott Kimball pled to today came to light. This is Scott's statement. I, Scott Lee Kimball, have pleaded guilty to two counts of murder in the second degree. This was part of a plea bargain arrangement. I am sorry for my crimes. I accept full responsibility for my role in these murders. I deserve to be held accountable and punished for my crimes. However, I did not act alone. What were you What's the purpose in marrying me and murdering my daughter? Pardon me? What would be, what the, would purpose be the purpose in marrying, in marrying me and murdering my sir. daughter? Uh, Scott's, Scott's answer to that, and, and you know, I'm very sorry for this, but uh, he says that, that they themselves were involved. There's absolutely no way. Absolutely not. There's no way. But thank you for that answer. That clears everything up for me. Let me just that clears up the bullet. Everything that was just said was just false. So there's no way. She was supposed to supervise Casey. I'm not. I'm not. I'm just hoping to have some kind of a legitimate either apology. It's he sad he, that he needs to contrive okay. something that's so deep, it's okay. ridiculous, and it's going to be I asked me. Okay, I asked Scott. I went with him. Okay, I asked Scott, okay, and I want you to understand, please, I'm giving you his statement, not mine, okay? Scott, you have a long criminal history of being a con man. That's correct. Um, are you a con man? Yes, I am. Are you good? I'm in prison, so I'm not that good. Some people say that you're an intelligent man, that you could perhaps have been anything you wanted to be in life. Smart. I'd agree with that. How good of a con man are you? Well, I don't know how to answer that question. Um, this is the first time I've uh, got a lengthy prison sentence, and I've been doing this for 28 years. What makes you so good as a con man? Uh, preparation. What do you mean? If you're going to do a con, you need to be prepared. You need to know what you're doing. People say that you are uh, a murderer, you are a uh, serial killer, um, you are cold-blooded. Any of that true? Um, well, part of it's true. I mean, there's part of that's part of it's true in every statement you made, except for the serial killer. I think that's just draws headlines. You know, um, a murderer. Yes, I committed murder. I pled guilty to murder, so I'd be a murderer. Cold-blooded. I don't believe that's true. I mean. The part of the FBI's problem is they didn't have anybody that had anything bad to say about me as far as you know, he stole or he's a thief. Nobody would ever say he lost his temper, he displayed violence, he was cruel to animals. That's never happened. Should people be afraid of you? No. Not unless they screw me over or they mess with me. Should people be worried that Scott Kemble, Hannibal, could get out of jail in less than 30 years? No, I'm retired. What do you mean by that? I'm retired. From what? I'm, I'm, I'm no longer associating with the, um, the groups or the uh, agencies or whatever you want to call them. So are you saying that you won't kill again? Um, I don't believe I will. Now you might think that's the end of old Scott. Not this guy. A Colorado serial killer is accused of trying to escape from prison. CBS4's Brian Moss has learned that Scott Lee Kimball will be charged with attempting to escape and solicitation for murder. We were there as a court sends Kimball to killing three women and his uncle eight years ago. He is now serving 70 years at the Sterling Correctional Facility. The body of one of his victims, Jennifer Markham, has never been found. And law enforcement investigators have eyed Kimball over the years in connection with other unsolved murders. In 2017, he attempted to break out of prison using a helicopter. It didn't quite work out when the FBI learned of it. Scott Kimball has been linked to other cases. Katrina Powell, who was found dead in a Denver suburb around the time Scott was active there, and he did confess to another inmate he had murdered her, though he never confessed to authorities. 
it's actually thought he could be responsible for over 20 missing people and unsolved crimes, including involvement in the West Mesa murders. How he did this, you know, while being under the nose of the FBI the entire time is unknown. Obviously, they he was just a master manipulator who could, you know, they never thought he would do something like this, which is a likely story. Who knows what he was really up to? He was up to a lot for a long time, and probably a hell of a lot more that we may never know of. Uh, well, I knew even prior to meeting him that he was a very intelligent person. And from interacting with him a lot, I, I know that he's very inquisitive as well. He wants to know exactly what's going on, uh, what is his current situation, what is law enforcement doing, what are other people saying. He's constantly asking questions. And uh, he's also very manipulative. Uh, he uses uh, situations, circumstances, and people to get his way. How effective is he? Very. He's a good reader of people. He, he is uh, quick to figure out uh, what makes people tick and what their likes and dislikes are. And he can, uh, he preys on people's ability to trust that people close to, like, people close to you won't harm you. And so he quickly gets close to people and takes advantage of that trust. It's going to be an ongoing investigation with him probably for the rest of my career. Uh, in dealing with him, actually, he's pleasant most of the time. Uh, so uh, as far as the genius classification, I don't know that I can give him that, but I can give you the other adjectives I'm pretty comfortable describing him as. So, you know, after hearing the story of Scott Hannibal Kimball, you realized, hey, maybe you're a fan. You can get your own piece of Scotty for yourself. His prison boots. Ooh, marked down from 199 to 150 bucks. You'd be a fool not to pick up these bad boys. Get some of that sweet Kimball foot pong. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. I will see you as always real soon in the next video. Take care of yourselves. Mike out.